So I've been away from a Bayagiri for not quite seven months, and now I'm back. It's good to be back. And I'm delighting in non-humid weather because it was hot and humid the entire time I was in Thailand. And I did spend one month in India, and it was hot and humid in India. And I spent two weeks in Burma, and it was hot and humid in Burma. And I spent five days in Malaysia, and it was hot and humid there too. <laughs> it was hot and humid everywhere, except America. It's uh, not humid here, it's just hot. Uh, but it's nice. The lack of humidity is very nice. I'm enjoying it. And I'm still a bit jet-lagged, but uh, otherwise feeling good and doing well. And rather than give a travel log of my time away, rather than give a summary, I wanted to more talk about maybe some of the lessons I learned from being away and some of the reflections that have been coming up. And one of the main reflections is just recognizing the wholesome mind, just what is the wholesome mind, learning how to recognize it and actually realizing that it's so utterly desirable and so, such a good thing to be cultivating, and that everything we're doing is to be cultivating a wholesome mind. Uh, faith is wholesome, mindfulness is wholesome. All of these states we're cultivating are very, very wholesome and good and skillful. And if we just open our eyes and look around us in a place like a Bayagiri, like this, then we see wholesomeness everywhere. Sometimes if we're just up in our head and we see we have this or that defilement, we, we don't really recognize the wholesome, but if we just look around, everybody's, everybody here is trying to do what's good, trying to do the right thing, and that's very wholesome. The day I got back here, so just a few days ago, Ajahn Chunda was giving me a tour of these new Kuti constructions, and, um, and I was just thinking, I was just saying, do, kind of in this state of, do, do we really own this place? Like, does this really belong to us, this place? Are we really here? Is this really happening? <laughs> it's totally amazing. You know, oh, what, and you're, you're telling me I'm, I'm actually leading this place? Like, is that really the case? <laughs> you're giving it to me? <laughs> That's uh, quite, a, quite a nice, nice state to be in. And uh, a lot of gratitude to Ajahn Shunda for allowing me this opportunity to uh, take a break, take an extended break. And I know it, it hasn't always been easy, to, uh, but it's been very important for me to have this time for myself and to, to think about things. Because it, uh, it was difficult, so it, it's uh, about four and a half years since I took over, as, uh, since I've been in the role of an abbot, the first two years of that as co-abbots with Ajahn Kurudamo, and then the next two and a half or so as, uh, as just a solitary abbot with Lung Pa as the guiding elder. Lung Pa Pasano as the guiding elder. So uh, now taking this, this break, coming back feel, very much feels like a new chapter. And part of my break was just trying to get the mind into a state where I could come back and do this in a good way. And rather than just doing it, which would, I didn't want to do it in an unwholesome way. I didn't want to do this in a begrudging or way or, or in a way that I developed resentment. I kind of was, before I left for this break, I was kind of getting afraid that I would become, if I just stayed as an abbot, I would just become an old resentful monk later on, just, uh, just walking around criticizing everybody and everything and kind of just stomping around and, and uh, just mumbling to myself, mumbling criticisms to myself about this or that person. Or, and I certainly didn't want to be moving in that direction, so I thought, well, I better make the mind wholesome now so that doesn't happen later because if I was to become an old abbot at some point, and uh, if I had moved in the wrong direction, then yeah, I thought, well, if I'm old and I, I become senile or something, then, then my mind will just default to whatever I've been cultivating before. So I better cultivate the wholesome now and get ready. <laughs> so so uh, the, the wholesome mind, it, it's very important to think about. 
And I, I link this also with a reflection on, I was reflecting on irritation. And one of the wonderful things about being in Thailand is that I get to meet a lot of amazing practitioners, not just monastics, but also lay people and really impressive, wholesome-minded people that I can learn from and take as an example. And so this one guy who'd been looking after me for uh, driving me around in Bangkok from time to time, offering rides, and uh, he's been keeping precepts for quite some time now, but he has a lot of friends who used to be drinking buddies, and, and uh, he was mentioning to me how yeah, I went to a party the other day with all my old drinking buddies and I didn't drink. I, I kept the precepts and I didn't drink. And I thought, oh, that, that must have been interesting. And he said, yeah, and I, I, I wasn't critical or, of them at all in my mind. I wasn't critical of them at all. They, were all. they were all drinking and I wasn't. And I was just looking at them and thinking, these are my friends. I, I love these guys. These are my friends. And, and I thought, oh, that's, that's the wholesome mind. Like non-judgmental, non-critical. Not, how do I get these guys to keep the precepts? I'm so irritated by their drinking. You know, that, that would be, that's actually unwholesome. So his mind was bright and wholesome, and I thought that's, that's a perfect illustration for how to have what uh, in Thai, in Thai, the Lung Pao Liam, he was teaching about this in a, in a talk recently. He said, Kwam Ben Mita Pap, which is an affect of friendliness cultivating an affect of friendliness. And that whether, whether people are, however people are acting around us to have that, that affect of friendliness, and that can be infectious, so that can rub off on people. It's not about criticizing others to get them to behave properly. That doesn't work so well. So it's, it's more about just that infectious, that infectious, Friendliness, it's not that we have to be friends with everybody or even like everybody, so we can actually be friendly to people we don't like. We might not feel, feel like we want to have a close relationship with everybody necessarily, but we can have that sense of non-irritation or that sense of friendliness. And then that lifts, that lifts the mind up. So our mind, when our mind becomes wholesome, then, then we are able to actually have a bit more wisdom. We can say what needs to be said, we can do what needs to be done, and there's a sense of fearlessness. So the Lung Por Cha, in one teaching, I remember he said that the mind can become, when it's wholesome, it becomes incredibly courageous, and it feels like it can achieve anything. You become incredibly optimistic. So I got, the opportunity to do two months of retreat at this uh, cave that we have access to is a very exclusive situation. There's a, uh, a down below and an up above area. It's in a place called Pak Chong in Korat province, Thailand. It's a few hours outside of Bangkok. And there's a lower area and upper area. So the lower area has a kuti, has a couple kutis and a large cave that has a walking meditation path in it and a place to sit. And then there's an upper area which has a kuti and a smaller cave. And this uh, lower area, the lower cave, even though it's better for walking meditation, it was quite damp and wet because there'd been some heavy rains. And so I ended up practicing in this upper area which has a smaller cave but it's drier and more well ventilated and then uh, spending the nights in the kuti and going in the afternoons practicing in this cave. And the cave is very, very quiet and gave this, this cave, because it was so quiet and it was cool, so it was a cool place to get out of the heat from outside. And because it was so quiet, uh, started to see the mind more clearly. The chatter in the mind becomes much more apparent in a very, very quiet situation. And so, uh, and then sitting for, you know, maybe four or five hours most afternoons in this cave. And uh, it's not always easy. There are pleasant times, but then there are times when I'm thinking, oh, I don't, I don't know if I want to go back to America. I think I, I might just want to stay in Thailand. 
and the mind recoiling from, from coming back uh, to America, to a Abayagiri, thinking, oh, you know, maybe I could just live on my own, stay in Thailand, and, you know, Ajahn Chunda can just keep, keep looking after things, and, you know, he likes doing it anyway, so I, I uh, don't have to go back. So the mind was thinking about that, and I got a bit depressed at one point, thinking, thinking, yeah, it's just, you know, these difficulties, and who knows what I'm going to experience if I go back and, and do, some, do the leadership thing again, and there might be difficult experiences, things that I don't want to experience, things that are unpleasant. And, but then later on, uh, towards the end of my time at this cave, uh, another reflection came up that, that actually made it, it sealed the decision for coming back, which was, I mean, I was already on track to come back. I, I had a ticket and everything, but I, part of my mind was like, I, I could not go back. I could actually do that. But uh, then what, what kind of sealed that indecision was, what, what put an end to that indecision or that sense of doubt was this reflection that, well, what's, what's noble? So we're actually supposed to be cultivating noble qualities as bhikkhus, and especially as senior bhikkhus. We're supposed to actually be get, lifting up and cultivating noble qualities, such as being humble, being patient. These are noble qualities, being generous. And what would the noble thing to do be? Whatever the noble thing to do is, I'll do that. Well, of course, the noble thing to do is to go back, pick up the duties again, and just deal with things as they arise. And that would be the noble thing to do. So I thought, well, that's, of course, that's what I'll do. So that's, that's the right thing to do. Because the noble thing to do is what's in line with Dhamma. And so that's, that's the right thing to do. And in the end, that's the wholesome thing to do, the helpful thing to do. So we want to do what's helpful. So I started thinking, well, well this, uh, something I've had an issue with in the past is irritation. So, so in a big community, if, uh, in a, and this is a training monastery where uh, we come to train and uh, there's a lot of young people who come here, young men who come to train and be celibate and eat one meal a day. And so there can be difficulties that arise. And uh, I know in the past when I saw somebody either speaking or acting in a way that, that I didn't agree with, I would get irritated even if it wasn't necessarily wrong, according to the rules or the precepts, the Vinaya, I could get irritated pretty easily. So I started thinking about this, this thing we call irritation and reflecting on it quite a bit near the end of my time in Thailand. Also, uh, just before coming back, I got to spend two weeks in Burma, so I was reflecting on irritation quite a bit there as well and what, what is the nature of it and why, why, why irritation? The more I thought about it, the more I thought it actually doesn't make any sense. Even though I've been irritated so much in the past, it actually doesn't make sense to be irritated. It doesn't actually make logical sense. So what is it? I, I started thinking, what is this thing we call irritation? And it is kind of trying to play out, why, why, do, why do I do this? Why do, why do we do this? And it, it really... Uh, trying to verbalize it, it's like, okay, you're, you're acting in a way that I don't, that I disagree with, therefore you should change. You're acting in a way that I disagree with, therefore you should, you need to change so that I can feel better. That's what irritation is. So yes, it doesn't make sense because we can only really, we can't really just, we can't grab somebody and just change them into something that's going to not irritate us because something else is... The nature of irritation is it's, it's irritated. And so, and it's like the nature of desire is that it has desire. Right? Fulfilling it doesn't make it go away. It just goes to something else. And so uh, it reminded me of this, this type of reflection on irritation reminded me of a teaching that Lung Por Ban gave. It was the last time I had the opportunity to pay respects to him when he was alive. And that was actually before I 
came back to pick up abbot duties, and one of the things he said was, uh, he was talking about the nature of Dhamma and the nature of practice, and he said, when the mind is enmeshed in the world, everything is an irritant. Everything is experienced as an irritant, and uh, we're, we're irritated by the, the eye gets irritated, the ear gets irritated, all of the sense bases get irritated, and the mind is irritated. When the mind is in the world, that's just the nature of it, is that it gets irritated. But when the mind has the Dhamma, then everything is seen as Dhamma. And that type of irritation doesn't, doesn't arise anymore. It passes away. And so that was that, I kind of brought that, brought that into the reflection. And so now if the mind uh, starts to go, go into like, why is this person doing that way? They're being, <laughs> I even, I won't go into details, but just had an experience even just getting back into America where somebody was mean to me and I, I total, totally was out of left field and I wasn't expecting it. And it was like the meanest somebody's been to me in years. And I, I just, uh, okay, this is, a, this is the test for coming back. This is the teaching. Does the mind get irritated by even this? And at first it was kind of like, oh my God, what's happening? And why did I come back? I knew I shouldn't have come back. <laughs> this is a sign. <laughs> but then right away it was kind of like, oh, this is the, this is the perfect test. This is the perfect test. And um, then it, it, uh, it ended up being okay, actually, in the end. So trying to make the mind wholesome is, is very, very important because there's irritants everywhere. There's irritants all around us and it's very, uh, it's very easy. It's very easy to get upset. It, it's, it's too easy. So, but when the mind isn't irritated or when the mind has friendliness and is wholesome, then it can become very optimistic and it can, we can say, oh, well, what do I have now? What, what do we have around us just right now? And what we have around us is, is goodness. I was looking at the, the shrine, these, these, wax, these wax flowers that were brought from Thailand. Those were made with faith. So people with a wholesome mind state made those. And then it's a wholesome mind state to offer flowers to the shrine as well. So there's flowers on the shrine. And there's a Buddha Rupa, in the, a small stone Buddha Rupa in the center here that was offered, by, offered from uh, Wat Pananachat. And all of these offerings, all of these offerings are from a wholesome intention, so they're pointing us back to wholesome mental states. So wholesome mind, this really creates strength. Precepts coupled with the wholesome mind and frequent meditation. So, so we develop strength. So that's another aspect of the practice, is the development of strength. So how do we develop strength? So we can, we can have good meditation experiences and the mind can feel peaceful, but it cannot yet be strong. It can be very sensitive. It can be very irritable still. Even if it is peaceful while we're meditating, what happens then when we need to do some sort of work? What happens then when somebody asks us to do something we don't want to do? You know, what happens when somebody criticizes us or does something, says something unjust to us or unkind to us? You know, what happens to the mind then? What happens to our peace then? What happens to our samadhi then? I remember an experience I had a long time ago. I was maybe one vasa or it was maybe during my second vasa. And that that's, tends to be a very difficult time for junior monks around the second vasa time when the sense of inspiration passes away and then you're living in the monastery and it's become normal and it's just drudgery, just living in the monastery day to day and uh, just feeling like things, sometimes feeling like things are going nowhere, practice is going nowhere, not able to see, not able to see all the wholesomeness around us. So I was in this, I, I was able to get in this irritable state very easily. But I remember one morning I'd have this very good meditation 
had a very good meditation, the morning puja. And yeah, it was during the Vasa, actually, because we were meditating up on the platform. We used to meditate up on the platform in the morning and evening during the Vasa. Now there's too many of us, and we have this air-conditioned hall, so we don't go up there anymore. But uh, we were meditating on the ordination platform up above, and I had this really amazing meditation and really peaceful. And uh, then we came down, and I was just kind of floating down on a cloud of of just thinking, wow, this this practice is amazing, and and then I got down, and then and then uh, and then a monk came and said something and blamed me for something that I had done wrong a few, few previous days before. So I'd come down, floating down in this cloud of peace, and then I got blamed for something, and then I just completely fell apart, and I started uh, yelling at this this monk, and. Uh, it was pretty awful, and uh, the mind just went straight into anger and rage. <laughs> so it was like, how, how, how powerful was that piece, actually? It wasn't very powerful. I mean, the meditation genuinely was pleasant. It was really, really nice, but it wasn't stable. It wasn't stable because there wasn't wisdom there yet. So the wisdom comes from when we make the mind wholesome. That That really creates that strength. So then... Uh, next time we have a peaceful meditation, it has to be strong enough. We, we can reflect, is this meditation strong enough to withstand the world, the worldly dhammas, the worldly winds that are going to come at us? No. Just staying by ourselves in a cave, yes, it can be pleasant for a very long time, but how is it going to be when we leave? How is it going to be when we have to interact with the world again? No. How is it going to be the moment somebody... Does, does something that we don't like. So we have to be, learn how to be strong. And it's not, it's not really a kind of a ma macho toughness, but it's strength in terms of dhamma, it's strength in terms of wisdom that we're cultivating. So the wholesome mind, it becomes, it becomes very optimistic and even in the midst of difficulties, even in the midst of things genuinely going wrong, it can remain courageous, it can remain optimistic. It can say what needs to be said, it can do what needs to be done. I find uh, also these days I tend to give a little bit of, uh, shorter talks because that, that can also be useful in terms of actually remembering what was said and reflecting on it and considering it. So I think I'll just leave it there for this evening, for this evening, for this evening.